Okay, it's just about time. I guess I will begin getting started. How's uh, the afternoon been going for everyone? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, I've been enjoying myself quite a bit. Uh, my name is Trek. Uh, I'm an engineer in Chicago. That's actually a picture of my building that I live in. Uh, I work at Groupon, a small company. If you're into hot yoga at half price, you may have heard of us. Oh, come on, that's a great joke. I kid, we do a lot more than just that, but it's kind of the fun joke. I'm also uh, on the core team of a web application framework called Ember.js. Uh, who's heard of Ember before? Yay, because yeah. man, four years ago, well, three years ago, I would ask that question and get a lot of blank stares. Uh, so I was out. Uh, I'm notorious for not finishing slides until like just before I do a presentation, so I actually finished these slides up about four minutes ago. And uh, I was out yesterday walking around trying to come up with like a good hook for this talk. Um, I do this a lot, I like walk around talking out loud like a crazy person trying to figure out what I want to call things and how I want a story to go. And I was like, you know, there's got to be a name for people like that. Turns out there is. Uh, peripatetic is a term. It means from traveling from place to place while working, uh, usually for short periods. Um, it comes from a Greek word, peripatoi, which actually means colonnades, so a little parts of those. Um, they're in the Lyceum in Athens, which was a place where people would go to learn. Uh, some members would meet among the colonnades and sort of just circle walking around. Aristotle used to do this theoretically. After his death, they, they thought he would do this. Um, so the word, although it meant colonnade, uh, entered into ancient Greek to mean wandering around while talking, even though its root was literally an upright series of columns. And I realized as I was, as I was walking through, like, I really like words. Uh, I like the sound. Uh, I like that if you look at a written word long enough uh, or hear a word long enough, they start to look funny. There's actually a word for that, uh, semantic saturation. It is the psychological phenomenon in which repetition causes a word or phrase to temporarily lose meaning to a reader. This often happens with the word book for me. I don't know why. Um, and then you'll perceive that word either uh, in, in, in seeing it or in hearing it as just sort of nonsense. So I like words. Uh, silhouette. It's kind of a strange word. Uh, it has come to have a very precise meaning. It is basically uh, someone seen in profile in black and white. Uh, the traditional method of creating silhouette portraitures was actually paper cutting. So they would uh, take a piece of paper, black, and cut it in, in someone's image. And it was very cheap and easy to do this. So people would do this at festivals and carnivals. And it became one of like, the easiest ways to get a portrait of someone. Uh, you could do it in free hands in a few minutes. Obviously, of French origin, dark shape and outline of something or something visible against a lighter background, especially in dim light. Uh, interestingly, although it comes from French, it has nothing to do with the French word for shadow, uh, which is where we get the word somber, by the way, uh, which means something entirely different. So where does Silhouette come from? Uh, silhouette comes from a man, Etienne de Silhouette. He was a French minister who in 1759 was forced by France's credit crisis uh, to impose really severe economic uh, demands upon the French people, particularly the wealthy, who were not very happy about this. Because of that silhouette's, uh, his austere economies, his name became synonymous with anything super cheaply made. Uh, and so we ended up with these outlines of photographs, uh, or outlines of portraits, not because they actually mean something related to shadow, they just migrated from a word that just meant anything really, really cheap to the very specific meaning of this type of portrait. Uh, and before photography, this is basically the cheapest, easiest way to get a portrait of someone. Uh, so we had a term that changed uh, from meaning uh, you know, a person uh, to having a very specific, like a uh, person who was a cheapskate, to having a very specific meaning. Cheapskate, by the way, is totally unrelated to skates. Uh, skate is actually a word we get from horses in the Old English. Uh, this, this is where skates comes from, the Dutch word for stilts. They let you glide along the mud in ease. All right, so cool. What does this have to do with JavaScript? You might be wondering. Uh, there are only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. The joke, of course, being and off by one errors. Um, programming, programming is ultimately about assigning words and, and concepts together. Uh, and words can give us important insight into concepts. Clear concepts often have very precise words attached to them. Murky concepts often have imprecise terms or you know, neologisms, neologisms attached to them. And these usually don't hold up under scrutiny or don't last very long. Um, we can't directly observe an idea. Um, so I have a sort of uh, organization of thoughts in my head that you cannot directly observe. Uh, I, I can only transmit them to you through words. And uh, it's a bit like this. Anyone know what this is? No? No science class people? Uh, Pardon? It's like x-ray crystallography. 
Yes, uh, pretty much, yes. So this is, this is a picture, well, not a picture of DNA. Uh, this is a picture of the reflection that DNA uh, atom molecules make when you shine light through them. Um, you couldn't directly observe DNA at the time. Uh, the best analogy I've heard of this is bit like being in a room with a chandelier behind you, and you can't see it. You can only see the light that it's casting. And then from that, you sort of have to imagine what a chandelier looks like, uh, which sounds like incredibly hard uh, to do, and yet two people did it. Watson and Crick did exactly this. From that reflection, they figured out the molecular structure of DNA. Um, so that's just a shadow, basically, of double helix. Um, words are a bit like this. They are, they are a lens that will allow you to see into another person's idea and concepts of what they talk about. Um, and they are our tool as programmers for synthesizing ideas, which we can't directly observe. And I would posit, at least in this talk, that imprecise words are a reflection of imprecise concepts um, or ideas that are not fully explored. Uh, the first cars were called horseless carriages. The only way they had to describe this new concept was by borrowing terminology from the previous world, which was you know, having, a, having a, course, uh, a horse in front of a carriage. Early cars retained many of the features of carriages in the past, including things like a holder for your buggy whip. Um, there are even, even patents for placing taxidermic horses on the front of horseless carriages so that you wouldn't frighten people. Uh, sometimes it was just a bust. Uh, other times it would be this sort of creature, which is like a full-featured horse, uh, which of course had a light shining from its eyes, so you could see at night, and uh, a way of opening and closing the jaws, which would make uh, noises, which is the earliest version of a car horn. Uh, this is patent from 1895. By 1900, we'd already moved away from the term horse horseless carriage to the term car, an automobile, so just in a few years. And then within a few years more, we went to this, the Model A, uh, then the Model T, uh, many prototypes in between. Uh, neologisms are great evidence of novel ideas. Uh, a single word is best and will arrive sort of, a single word for an idea is kind of the best, and you'll arrive at a common usage of it when you've kind of like nailed down what a really good idea is. Compound words like horseless carriage, I would say, or single page application indicate that we really haven't nailed down what we're talking about yet. So uh, what, what is a single page application? Uh, let's unpack this a bit by first talking about what applications are. Um, I just made this definition up. A computer program that executes in response to user interac interaction to accomplish a goal. Um, when developing application as, as an engineer, there's a, many things you have to take into consideration. Um, a user navigating around, uh, clicking and scrolling, keeping track of the current screen that the person is looking at, actually rendering that screen, uh, behavior that happens when the user may, may or not be around, so processing payments, uh, long-term persistence of data, sending and receiving emails. Um, and, okay, so that's application. Uh, what, is this, what is this web part of application? Uh, well, when you're talking web, uh, you're still talking about all this stuff because you're still building an application, but we're talking about dividing the work we have to do between two environments, client and server. So somewhere we have to draw a line. And on one side of the line, we will say this is the client, and on the other side of the line, we will say this is the server. It might go here, it might go there. Uh, might not map very neatly to our concept of division of labor and split something right down the middle. Um, so it's a little abstract. Uh, let's go through uh, several strategies for organizing an application that's delivered by the web. Uh, and, and by taking a real, real, real world application and sort of uh, digesting and spitting out how we would do it. Um, to the user, I think it's important to note, uh, all these implementations are roughly equivalent to their experience. Um, so let's talk about an application in the browser. Um, so this is simple. I don't know if it still looks like this. these screenshots are about a year old. Uh, this is an app. There's a lot of data. Uh, a lot of areas where a user can trigger interaction. Developers have to answer what happens when a user interacts with one of those regions. How do we translate that interaction event into some sort of user intent? How do we decide, like, what is the user trying to do when they interact with this part of the screen? Uh, so, for example, if you click on this, uh, in a server-based request response document style application, we usually serialize that intent as a URL. And the browser knows to translate that URL into fetching a new resource. And those resources can be sort of mostly the same pixels. And so the user perceives the difference between one resource and the next as a continuous flow. Uh, that's trickery, and it's the same sort of trickery that we use to make things like movies work. Um, it's basically just a human perception bias that we're taking advantage of to create the illusion of a consistent flow. So the user processes the visual difference between these two pages as just the change, basically. If you had much faster perceptions, so you imagine uh, maybe extremely low bandwidth, uh, and you were looking at one page, and then it went blank perceptibly, and then 
turn to this and to a new page, the illusion is ruined, basically. So here we are on this page, and like, it, it doesn't feel like a continuous flow to us anymore. OK, so uh, that's the interaction we're going to talk about. And I'm going to talk about how you might implement this using technology in a number of ways. Uh, so ignoring uh, technology, let's go through this from a, from a user's perspective just sort of once. Um, so we start with a blank page. I request uh, uh, simple.com, and I get this. I interact with this portion of the page. Now I'll see this. I interact with that edit button. Now I see this. I make some changes to the text. Interact with another part of the screen, and now I see this, and we're done. So that's our interaction. Um, and that, let's put the divide between client and server right about there to start, and walk through how we might do this. So uh, this is just from a technology perspective. Uh, a request and a response. So that's the first request. Triggers a get. Response is triggered. The response returns uh, some HTML that turns into a DOM. The browser will draw, and the user ends up seeing this page. Uh, they click with this, this part of the page, which has a URL encoded to it. HTTP is triggered again, so now we get another request to this location. The screen blanks out. Response comes back. DOM is built. The browser draws, and now the user sees this page. Cool. Then they go and they click this. Another HTTP request. Everything previous is wiped out. Response returns with some HTML. The DOM will be built, the browser will draw, and then the user will see this. Uh, so that we allow them to interact with the text field a bit and then click this button. That'll make another HTTP request. In this case, I'm gonna say it's a put. Um, that will do some 302 style behavior and then we'll redirect you back to your activity page. Previous day, the screen will blank out and here's the new thing. HTML comes back, the DOM is built, the browser will draw, and now the user sees this and the whole interaction is done. Cool. Um, so that flow is pretty good uh, for documents, less good for interactions. It's a fairly slow user experience and will often not ma match a user's mental model of what's going on. Remember, their perception is that only small parts of the screen are changing, um, when in fact we as developers know that we're actually wiping out all the previous state and returning a new state. Um, because of that mismatch, if there's even a small delay, you will ruin that illusion of a continuous experience. Um, so you can imagine a sort of nightmarish world uh, where like, you're interacting with an application and your goal is to like maybe uh, see something several screens away and you have to click and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. This used to be the world we lived in. So this is MapQuest from the late 90s. Um, and if, who remembers using Map pre-Google pre Maps MapQuest? Right, so I mean, how frustrating it was. It like, you know the part of the map you want is three tiles north and you're like, <laughs> click, wait, click, wait. All right, so. Uh, I would say this is not an ideal way of delivering an application to a user. Um, thankfully, uh, the browser gives us a programmatic way of changing the hierarchy of a document. Uh, and that will get redrawn for us. Uh, the browser will handle that for us rather than having to go fetch an entirely new document, which is fantastic. If something like the DOM is a low-level API did not exist, uh, what would we do? Uh, your first inclination might be like, well, fine, let's write a regular expression parser for HTML. Do not ever do this. It was a horrible experience. Um, okay, so let's go through that experience uh, from a user's, or the user's experience again from this sort of uh, sending DOM down and then doing some manipulations to it. Uh, so we start with a blank page again. User requests an application as before, which will trigger a get request, and then the page turns into this. Cool. A user interacts with a portion of it, so clicking there. And previously, we've set up some sort of event handling onto it. And this is going to make an AJAX recall get a response from a server, that'll be some HTML, and we're gonna inject it into a particular part of the DOM. Um, so it might come back as data, and we might turn it into uh, DOM, or might we get HTML straight back and we just shove it in. Um, so the old selection of the page empties, response comes back, and now we're gonna update that div instead of redrawing. All right, so continuing, user clicks edit. Uh, we have attached an event, so we get some more uh, event handling. Um, and we're going to clear out the old part of the sec uh, old section of the page and draw just the new part. Um, and that'll insert new DOM nodes. Uh, user clicks the save button after they've edited. We get a request and a response again based on events that we've set up. Old part of the screen goes blank and then is redrawn. And now we're done. So that's decent. Uh, that probably is sort of like the, the standard of the web at this point. Uh, but it does cause some goofy issues. Um, a single object from a, a uh, data perspective has many representations to the user. 
Uh, so in this case, a single transaction can be represented in a number of ways. It could be an item in a list, uh, it could be this sort of show view, and it can be this kind of ed edit view. And uh, this representation has this sort of, in the way we've implemented it now, this sort of mixed truth paradigm. So when we first send the data down, some of that truth is in the DOM. Um, sometimes it's, you know, because it, it's coming down, or sometimes it's in data. So we're fetching JSON or, and re-rendering a particular part of the side panel. Uh, so when it's just JSON turning into data, it's not so bad. Uh, we find a part of the DOM and we start updating it, yada, yada, yada. Maybe even use a template to make this a little easier. Uh, blow away the old inner HTML and put it in. So I think that would address the problem of sort of a mixed truth model. Um, nope. Sometimes it's even worse because now we have truth in DOM and then we also have truth in data. Um, we're mixing this request response model and the dynamism of, of an application basically. Um, and we have to support both of these models simultaneously. So you think, okay, this is fine. Uh, we'll share templates between server and client. That will solve this. It's turtles all the way down. Uh, it'll solve interview consistency, uh, and everything will be good. Uh, did anyone happen to notice that the event, uh, even in the list, you can have updates based on data changing? So pending shows up and then goes away. So the developer bears the additional responsibility in, in this style of development of keeping track of the object truth and making sure to track the parts of the DOM that need to update when that object and that data change. Uh, if you forget, the data loses sync, and I can guarantee you, you will forget. And that's just for single interactions. So you imagine we have to build up and maintain an organization for all of these interactions. Uh, and this is just a simple application, so over a while we're gonna end up in a world where we basically just get it wrong. Um, famously, people joke about this. Uh, so if you go on Twitter, uh, depending on whether, well, you know, which particular uh, code has loaded, clicking a tweet, uh, what will it do? Depends. And if you think, well, it's fine. I will, I will for sure get this right. I guarantee you, you will get this wrong. So this is an interaction on GitHub that's using this sort of like mixed server and in-browser rendering. Um, will, it, will it go? Yeah. So here I am. I have added a comment. Cool. I go away to some other page like CNN, and I realize, like, oh, wait, there's something else I want to say. So let me go back. Uh, <clears throat> where's, where's my comment? Oh, if I reload the page, oh, there it is. If GitHub cannot get this right, a place that arguably can like draw the best talent in the industry, I guarantee you, you will not get this right. Um, so please don't do this approach. Okay, uh, so let's, let's take a look at what this approach would look like. So we've moved the rendering, uh, or we've moved rendering entire, entirely into the client, and we're using the server just for sort of background processing and data persistence. Um, I'm going to use Ember as an example of doing this, but honestly, uh, Ember is in sort of the functional reactive programming family of client-side rendering, so this is equally true for all of those frameworks. So you can insert, obviously not the exact code samples, but the same pattern with React or Angular, if you like. Uh, so how do we handle this doing client rendering? Well, we're going to move all the rendering into the browser. We still need some mechanism of subdividing our screen and doing sort of uh, per-section rendering. And in pretty much all of these uh, frameworks, you're going to have something like a router, and the router will act very much like a state machine. Uh, so you'll have declarative style uh, statements about like the states of your application, and there'll be specific ways that you can move through them. So state machines, for people that don't know, they're a formalized language for describing a set of possible states and how you can move from one state to another. Uh, turns out they're a great way of describing uh, application behavior as well. Uh, so Ember and React and Angular actually link these concepts together. Uh, so state some features of state machines, uh, multiple states, so those are all states. Uh, substates, state could have sort of states inside of it. Uh, you'll probably have an initial state, so this is sort of like the state it is when the machine starts up. Uh, you'll have transitions between states, and only very specific transitions are allowed. So doing insane things like moving from proposing a course to final exams is simply not possible. The application will stop you from doing it. Um, so again, Ember and Angular and, and React kind of tie the notion of uh, application state and state machines together. So uh, what, here's what the state machine would look like for the simple interaction we've talked about so far. It's very simple. Uh, initial state there, we can move to an index of transactions. You can transition into viewing. You can transition from there into editing. And then that will take you back into viewing or you could go, or sorry, back to the index or you could go back to viewing. Um, so, pretty simple. Uh, let's take a look at how you would or might potentially do this in Ember. Um, so I'm gonna do some pseudo code. Uh, this is the actual Ember code, but it's sort of missing pieces that are not necessary for the example we're gonna give. So 
here's a site. Um, we are going to add a router. Um, in this case, we're just going to have a blank router with no actual states inside of it. Um, Ember, it turns out, has a sort of default state called the applications route uh, that will render the outer part. So we can define what will get rendered, and I'll just say I want to render a template called application, and we'll provide some model data to it, and that will be an asynch asynchronous call. And then that async call will come back with some data. And sorry, don't know if you saw the little flip. We moved to showing a template really quickly because the screen's pretty limited. Um, and then the data that comes back from the Ajax and the template will combine to render particular parts of the screen. So see how that works? Pretty obvious. Uh, <clears throat> and then somewhere in that template, we also have a place that says uh, when a substate is entered into, its template should go somewhere on the screen. In this case, we're going to say right there. So. Uh, that gets us to here, and how would we fill in sort of that site, or how do we fill this area in? I would say we'll create a state for transactions. Uh, we can specify a path, because we're dealing with URLs on the web. A route, uh, which will again say which template it would like to render and do some data fetching. We'll do some Ajax, the data will come back, and then the template and the data will get combined and we'll render that part of the screen. And then again, we have another outlet. So, a state machine will allow you to have nested states sort of as deeply as you need to go, and so the router also allows you to have nested states as deeply as you need to go. And then we can fill in this section. Uh, we just add a new definition for it, so I'm gonna call this index and say its path is forward slash. Uh, I'll define a, an index tra uh, route for it and say render the index template. We'll do some data fetching. I just said dollar sign index to summary. That data will come back, and then eventually we'll combine with a template and render for us. Um, so, a user interacts with this. Um, let's assume that this triggers a brand new request. We're gonna blank the screen out like before. So we're gonna do a get, fetch all these assets again, and just still do the rendering. Um, so we'll have this repeat, because we have to re-render the outer application area. We'll do the template rendering again. We'll have that outlet. We'll have this part repeat, because it's still on the screen. So that all repeats, and now we show this. Cool. Um, so you should be thinking to yourself, well, that's, that's kind of goofy. There's a lot of duplication uh, to have re-rendered all of that stuff. And in fact, you are correct. Uh, we don't really need to re-render all of that. We can just re-render the parts of the screen uh, that represent the change in state, which much more closely matches a user's mental model of what's actually happening. Um, so let's transition here to viewing, view a single one, combine with the template. All right, so moving from that to that, uh, it is actually probably not necessary to redraw all of that parts of the screen. Um, we really just wanna change sort of those two sections, right? We wanna highlight a particular item, and then we wanna say uh, that there's a new part of the screen that's being displayed. Um, and it gets even better, uh, oops. So here's how we would do that. Here's the old uh, template for the screen, and I'm gonna update it to use this linking terminology that the Ember router has. And this basically just says, okay, so from wherever we are now, uh, go into the viewing state. And the router will stop you if that's not possible, you'll get an error. Um, and it gets even cooler than that because uh, we have access to the transaction object already, right? Like we've rendered it in the list. So in fact, we probably don't even need to do data fetching. We can just immediately re redraw a different representation of that same data. Cool. Uh, okay, let's finish this up. Uh, the edit screen, I'm gonna turn that also into a link to a new state, and I'm going to go ahead and pass the, the object. I'm also gonna supply a tag name, so I'm gonna say this, this link is a button, so it'll show up as a button. Uh, I'm gonna add a new route for that. Uh, and then this route object will say, render the editing template. We'll do some data fetching, although if we've already provided this object, we don't need to do any data fetching and it might be skipped. Um, and then this is a little trickier because there's that save button. I'm just gonna say the save button goes into this part of the router we call actions. Um, and this is where you do sort of non-route based uh, actions. So this is gonna do some Ajax to some URL with a post, and then when that's done, we're gonna transition back to the viewing state. Cool. Okay, uh, bring that back. Uh, so, that's a lot about web applications. Uh, what about single page? Um, thanks to Node, uh, there's nothing that's saying we can't run that same code client server. Um, we can take the same application code responsible for rendering, and we can do it, we can deliver it to the client for rendering in the future, or we could actually just do it on the server as an initial render and then send additional concept, or additional data down. Um, and this should be pretty much entirely hidden from the developer. Um, there's, no, there's no need as a developer, you should need to make a distinction about which environment rendering is occurring in. 
Uh, so it's basically like this pattern, which I said absolutely do not do, uh, with the one difference of that we're not trying to match behavior between environments. So if you imagine on the right-hand side is like Java and on the left-hand side is JavaScript, we're not trying to match behavior, which will pretty much for sure lead to errors. We're just going to run certain parts of our application in mixed environments. Uh, so it's a little more like this Venn diagram. So it's basically this. Instead of duplicating behavior across environments, we're actually going to have code that runs in both environments. Cool. Uh, so if we have code that runs in, uh, can either render a fully uh, statically rendered uh, sort of service style application, or can do rendering in the browser, uh, what will we call it? That's clearly not single page, because you could render all multiple pages, or you could render subsections of a page. Um, I would posit we will just call them web applications. <laughs> uh, we're so close. Uh, the technology is finally getting there, but we can just call it this. And uh, before you're like, no, 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 there, there's for sure a distinction between rendering on the client and rendering on the server. I think we will still need a way to talk about this. Uh, we constantly redefine how we deliver content on the web in terms of technology. From the user's perspective, they rarely notice, but we're like constantly changing technology. And eventually the old pattern will sort of be subsumed by the new pattern and the new way of doing things. So imagine this is, this is how we used to do uh, web pages, right? Uh, requests would be triggered by the client. A web server would handle that. It would probably match a URL directly to some file in the file system, send that file back up to the user, and the user would show it. Cool. Web pages. All right. Uh, when we switched out the file system and made an application generate these pages uh, dynamically, which basically is how you get the modern web, right? You can imagine uh, no, no team of uh, diligent little old ladies is ever going to be able to recreate Amazon's catalog in the, in the depth and breadth that it has when a machine can do it. Uh, what did we call this? Web pages. It doesn't matter that an application is delivering the page up or a file system is delivering it up. Even though it's vastly different than how the web was imagined to be, um, we just called it web pages. There was probably an intermediary, intermediary, intermediary period where we had some special term to be like, oh, no, no, no. These are dynamic web pages, right? Oh, dynamic, whoa, dynamic web pages. Do, do you use the cool new dynamic uh, web page framework, PHP? Um, but now we just call these web pages. And uh, I would posit uh, that in the very near future, uh, and if you're attending the next talk, it is, this is an excellent segue to the React talk about isomorphic apps. Uh, this is basically the world we're going to be in. Uh, rendering will be indistinguishable server client, and as a developer, you won't need to worry about that. Um, and that is all I have. Any questions? I've either totally convinced you or you think I'm crazy. Sorry, what's the question? Uh, Which... Can you tell us about your experience working with Ember, like what parts you build? Because I want to like, shake your hand and give you a round of applause. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was, uh, what parts of Ember do I do? Uh, so I'm on the core team. I, um, am, I, I deal with, uh, I'd say like developer experience is probably the closest thing. So I'm in charge, or not in charge, but like focus very heavily on the documentation guides and uh, de helping design the public API. Um, and then we have other people that do like perf and tooling and stuff. Thank you. The questions? Yes. Uh, the question was, does Ember do the server-side rendering? Uh, no, it does not yet do it. Uh, the tools for this are not quite there. Uh, there's nothing technologically that would prevent you from doing it. Uh, there is just, uh, there is a mountain of work to be done and only so many hands to help climb, unfortunately. Um, so pull requests are mostly welcome. Uh, so the question was, how does this compare with something like Meteor? I would say Meteor uh, is pretty close to this. Uh, the one difference is the, the lock-in that you get uh, with having to like, use their particular tool chain. So I still think there are parts of the stacks. Uh, Dishal talked in his initial keynote about sort of like uh, the stack now having three layers. There's sort of like the data layer, there's the server rendering web application, and then there's the client rendering web application. Um, mm -hmm. Meteor kind of wants to control that all the way from database to, to user clicks. Uh, I, think there's, I, I think there's still parts of the web that are like best served by stuff that's not Meteor. Um, so at Groupon, we actually use uh, the exact sort of thing Dshaw talked about. We had a giant Rails application um, that was failing to scale, uh, not in the way you might think. It was not failing to scale because it was like, oh, we can't, you know, there's not enough RAM in the world to deliver up all these hot yoga coupons. It was failing to scale. <laughs> Uh, in the sense that like, you can only throw so many developers at a single project, and Rails is not designed, nor do I think it should be designed, 
uh, for writing anything than, other than a single application. Um, that single application it, it describes most of the web. Very few applications reach the scale where it's like more than 30 or 40 developers, right? Uh, we did, and Rails wasn't good enough for us. We actually broke, uh, broke our single application into many smaller applications inside something we call iTier, um, <clears throat> which has like a data layer uh, that is you know, several hundred APIs written in whatever the developers wanted to write it in, uh, a layer in Node that, that will do Ajax fetching, uh, and then do rendering, and re by rendering I mean you take data and you mush it into a template and send back HTML. Um, and, the, and the applications doing that, uh, are there's like 30 or 40 of them. To a user, they all appear to be the same application. Um, so the question might be like, why didn't we use Meteor for something like that? And the question was, uh, or the answer to that was basically like, we needed finer grained control over how parts of our stack behaved, especially down at the data layer. Um, so, I don't know, Meteor is very cool. Um, I wish, they've gotten much better about this recently, but I wish they had started out with the notion of like very strict separation. <clears throat> so if you decided you like loved Meteor's client side application stuff, but didn't really care about their server stuff, you could be like, yeah, I don't want that, but I still want to use the server stuff. Um, I, I think they have not gained traction in places where uh, combinations of client architecture and server architecture combined however you like have been very, very good. Um, so if you want a Meteor-like experience, um, something like Ember or React with Firebase um, feels like magic. So, sorry, it was a very long-winded answer to that question. <clears throat> Other questions? Cool. All right. Thank you, everyone.